Starting a prayer series, today we're going to be talking about selfless prayer according to the will of the Father. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net, bringing Jesus to your face. I'm an author of the Christian Supernatural book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, which chronicles my supernatural experiences before and after encountering Jesus in 1995. I blog Christian testimonies, ministry spotlights of people actually on the front lines of ministry, actually getting off the couch and making a difference in the world for Jesus Christ. I pray about what the Lord wants me to podcast, and sometimes I wax prophetic. Um, I strive to solve, to have, I seek the Lord for kingdom keys for real problems that we have today with biblical uh, spiritual solutions. Now, recently the Lord has been dealing with me on prayer. The topic of prayer and the key phrase that has been an anchor in my spirit recently is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We find that in James. This has been an anchor text in which I keep one foot on the base. You know, before I run and steal second base, I'm keeping my left foot on this one, right? <laughs> so when I have an opening, that's where I go. That That's one way of explaining it. Um, the other way is just, you know, I don't stray away from this text. This is my pivotal text uh, over this next series that I'll be doing. Now, here's the context of the verse so that we know what it is. Is there any among you afflicted? This is James five thirteen through 18. Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth much fruit. Now that's a good text, you know, because it focuses, I want you to notice that it focuses on real people in the congregation. James isn't just highlighting the superheroes of faith, like Paul with the healing handkerchiefs or Peter with the healing shadow, but these are real people in the congregation that James is addressing as far as audience relevance is concerned. They're faced with real-world problems. Here James is talking about sick people, not apostles who are sick, you know, or prophets or bishops or whatever, but real people in the congregation. Now, Jesus says something that's pretty inspiring if you really think about it and pray about it. In John fourteen twelve through 14, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, that's us, who believes on Jesus, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, or the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, notice that, you know, there's a lot. This has got a lot in there. You know, we probably want to focus on, oh, we're going to do greater works. But there's some parameters here. Um, believing on Jesus is one, right? And then according to his name. Uh, according to his name means in his nature, character, and authority. It's not just a tagline at the end of the prayer saying, in Jesus' name. You know, that's... Not exactly what that means. If you follow me, you know what I'm talking about. It means walking in the nature, character, and authority of Jesus Christ and believing on him. Um, Pistuio, it means to rely upon. I podcast about this quite often. If we couple with what Jesus says here with the text in James, we see something awesome. Now, 
Keep in mind, as far as audience relevance, when Jesus was saying this, he has not yet gone to the cross. He was giving his disciples some instructions at the Last Supper. And these disciples, in fact, that are sitting there that know him, did things like the healing with the shadows, like Peter, you know? Um, So they did go on and do some awesome things. So we find key components here, which is belief, and believe if we believe in Jesus, our fruit will line up with what he says in the word. Belief comes from the Greek word pistuo. Like I said, again, it's not intellectual assent. A lot of people intellectually assent that Jesus is Lord, but they're, they don't make him Lord. You know, they're fruit of their life. I mean, 90% of Congress says they're Christians. Do you believe that? <laughs> I mean, are, is there fruit measuring up to being a Christian? So the good news is here that there is hope for the believer. Jesus gives us keys to the kingdom principles in the holy word of God that avails to the believer, to us to be overcomers, to be healed, to be set free, to change the world, to set revival fires and stoke revival fires. We can walk in the supernatural, and I'm going to tell you that even the most sold-out Christians today, the most sold-out Christians today in 2015... I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I say we're only walking at the kindergarten level of faith that's available to us. We're walking nowhere near where we could be if we dare to believe and step out in faith on the Spirit-led Word of God. John G. Lake, Maria Woodworth Etter, Smith Wigglesworth, A. A. Allen, Jack Coe, and all the recent generals of faith that we can read about and even watch YouTube videos, they caught the revelation and the anointing and just dared to step out and believe God. They had relationship with God. They followed the Spirit of God and look at the miracles that happened in their ministries. I believe these are available to all the believers. We just are not walking in the level that is available to us. And I don't believe we're walking in our destiny. <laughs> I believe we are all called. That's our destiny, but we're just not there, you know? Now, keep in mind, it isn't the cakewalk of faith. It's the In the Ephesians 6, isn't it about marshmallows? It's about armor, you know? Uh, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will not suffer joy, but tribulation, right? The Hall of Fame of Faith was not it was written about overcomers, not politicians that tickle your ears. So it's a good fight of faith, you know. We need to examine ourselves. Where do we line up in comparison to what God's destiny is, the ones that he showed us? God has a destiny for me and you, right? And we keep letting things get in the way. So we're going to we're going to analyze that today. I'm going to tackle a few aspects of faith in God relative to prayer. I'm going to use scripture and I'm going to use some of my own personal experiences so that I can share with you what I know about answer, answered prayer. And the most important thing I can say, you know, if you just want to distill it down to the crux of the matter, it comes to relationship with God. Relationship with God. It's not a formula. These people that are in the Bible that model prayers for us, they weren't doing voodoo. They weren't doing incantations. They were actually they actually had a relationship with God. They didn't they didn't just think they had a relationship with God like Saul did. Remember Saul before he met Jesus? He was persecuting Christians and he was using the Bible to do so, right? Thinking he was ordained by God, thinking he was doing God a service, but he didn't know Jesus. And in Acts nine he meets Jesus, and then only after he meets Jesus can he do the handkerchief miracles, right? Raise people from the dead. It's only after you meet Jesus and have a relationship with him that you can do these things. So it's not incantations or voodoo or churchcraft or witchcraft or whatever. They're not formulas. It has to do with relationship. So the first topic I want to talk about will be selfless prayer. Selfless prayer, not selfish prayer. This is something that has been highlighted in my life. I guess I've always seen it in Scripture, but it hit me, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago uh, to be something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, the reality of what the text is saying compared to what we actually do. See, we need to line up with what the Word says 
And any time we find something that we're off, we go, wait a minute, Lord, show me the rest of the Scripture, show me this, let the Spirit of truth guide me. And then we be not conformed to this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We renew our mind to what the Word of God says. We have the mind of Christ written right out in front of us. We know what it says. Then we just line up to it. And we're all guilty of doing these things. We're all guilty of selfish prayers. But now I say, you know, it's a waste of time. It's counterproductive, and it doesn't really contribute to our crowns. (laughs) If you look at it from God's perspective, why are we praying selfishly? Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven in his ways of doing things, right? So I'm going to talk about a couple of scriptures, you know, here in the podcast. And and these are things that we kind of glaze over, because when we go to the Christian bookstore or we turn on the popular uh, TV stations and listen to the popular evangelists, they're writing about how we can get more money, um, how we can have our selfish prayers answered. I mean, think about it. What do you see in the bookstores, right? Anyway, I don't want to get off too much on that, but it's not really about living by faith, you know, but how we can get our needs met by the Lord. Uh, and anyway, um, have you ever noticed that the prayer model that Jesus lays out for us in the Lord's Prayer is give us our daily bread. Yeah, give us our daily bread. It's not give me my daily bread, right? Ever notice that the manna fell down for the the children of Israel, not in each person's tent they had to go out and get it, but it was a collective effort. They were all fed. It was for the entire populace of the people that followed God. It, the manna only fell for the people that followed the cloud. Ever notice that Jesus let the people go three days without eating, and then he fed them all with a miracle. Not just a select few, he fed them all. How about when Peter needed his taxes met, the Lord showed Peter a coin in a fish's mouth to pay just enough for them both their taxes and no more. You know, the just shall live by faith. And as you probably noticed that money neutralizes faith, if money keeps solving your problems instead of faith, pretty soon your faith kind of just withers away, right? Money can't, let me, let me just give you an example. Money can't heal terminal cancer, but faith in Jesus can. So we need to pay, a, we need to value faith more than mammon. Right? You can't serve God and mammon. Ever notice as you read the scriptures that God refers to the children of Israel, no matter which generation, by their tribal names over and over again? Have you ever thought about that? God looks at things from, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his way of looking at things and his righteousness. He looks at all this as a family problem. <laughs> you know, we're a family. Now, this may sound weird, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple of somewhat selfish prayers. I was praying to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, where are some selfish prayers in the Bible? Because as I was thinking about all these prayers, you know, the prayer of Daniel for the national repentance, he was confessing the sins of the nation. Um, Jesus' prayer, you know, Jesus had a selfish prayer. How, how about that one? He says, Lord, you know, not my will, but your will be done. Right? He, he's like, except I drink this cup. He actually went through with the will of the Father. You know, that was selfish for a little bit. And then he, he's like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do the Lord's plan. And I kept looking at prayers in the Bible, and I'm like, well, you know, where are the real selfish prayers? Even, even David. David checked with the Lord. He's like, Lord, do you want me to go up and whack these Philistines? And the Lord would say, yes or no. You know, he sought the Lord's will, God's perspective. But there's a couple of selfish prayers that, you know, they're kind of selfish, but they, they kind of also accomplish the will of God. And I thought, you know, I'm going to bring this up to my podcast audience because they're interesting. I don't know if you remember, the one that hit me first was Jephthah. Jephthah is a guy in Judges 1130. And uh, he he needed to whip on up on the on the Ammonites, and it was really important to him personally for some reason. So he prays somewhat 
a a prayer of faith, but he kind of adds a little selfish twist to it. You know, he wanted it for his glory. In Judges eleven thirty through thirty two, and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, "If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me." When I return in peace from the Lord of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over into the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. Now, it was probably the Lord's will to deliver Ammon into Jephthah's hands anyway, but Jephthah had to put a little selfish thing in there. He says, uh, into my hands. You know, it wasn't like he was seeking the will of the Lord in his ways of doing things right. He's like, you know, I want to be the one that gets the glory for this. And the rest of that story, if you don't know the, the end of the story, it's kind of really sad because Jephthah had to sacrifice his daughter. The first thing that he saw as he came home was his daughter. And as I ponder this, and I want you to ponder it too, you know, Jephthah somewhat prayed according to the will, but he kind of twisted it to be a little selfish, right? And notice that it was according to the Lord's will in in the overall big picture. And this is like Jephthah saying, Lord, if you bless my ministry, I will offer you this and that. Well, it's God's ministry. We're stewards. Hannah prayed for a child. You remember the mother of Samuel? the great prophet um, in 1 Samuel 1, 10 and 11. If you remember, she would go up and people would give her a hard time about being barren. You know, the Lord had shut up her womb, so to speak. And in verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, kind of like Jephthah, right? And said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but while give unto thy handmaid a man-child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Well, I don't know really why the Lord wanted me to share this with you, but, you know, maybe it was God's will for Samuel to be born anyway. (laughs) You know? And, uh, but anyway... It worked out really well. Uh, Genesis fifty twenty says the devil meant it for evil, but God turns it around for good. Maybe in this whole big plan, uh, this was in the willing, in the will, and in the timing of the Lord. This is something to ponder about. But it's, I was I was looking at this as somewhat of a selfish prayer, but you know it turned out to be for the good of Israel. Isn't that interesting? So. I'm thinking here that God had planted the desire in her heart. You know, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Maybe God planted that desire in her to pray for it. All right? So these are some examples of somewhat kind of a selfish prayer. And I, you know, it's like I'm I'm talking about the opposite of the point I'm trying to make. So I'm going to finish out here with a couple of scriptures that say that you know we we need you know remember Jesus says seek ye the first the kingdom of heaven first the kingdom of heaven right in His ways of doing things right then these things will be added unto you and notice that you know He's talking about food water and clothing you know it's not like cars mansions luxury yachts. He's saying your needs will be met if you seek God. He's saying if you follow the glory cloud, you know, your needs will be met. Manna falls from heaven if you follow the Lord, right? If you believe in me, greater works shall shall you do. And um, notice none of the apostles or the prophets and stuff prophesied themselves something selfish, right? Just look at the model. Just look at the model prayers. Now, Oh, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and say this one verse, though. This just hit me as I was praying about this, because I just it just hit me that some of the people are thinking about. Well, Solomon was wealthy, 
Yeah, but you know, let me let me explain a little bit about that. The Lord just hit me with this this scripture here. I'm going to read something in Deuteronomy eight sixteen through nineteen. Um, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou say in thy heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it's he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall perish. Now, what's going on here is wealth in Deuteronomy 8.18 is to establish the covenant. Solomon's temple was to establish the covenant. That's the primary use of wealth. Um, you know, when people pour into our bosom, we should overflow. We should be a blessing to other people. So, you know, I the the selfish stuff that's going around right now, you re- need to really read the Word of God and, and see if it lines up with the spirit of truth. Now, we're going to deal with some of the other scriptures later. Um, You know, Jesus says, ask whatever you want in my name, and how that's kind of twisted out of context. But, you know, wealth is for the covenant. It's not for our own selfish lusts. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here that kind of highlight that. And these are probably the ones I should have started out with. But for some reason, I wanted to highlight the selfish prayers um, and how they actually kind of, God answered them because they were kind of according to his will. You know, uh, James 4, 2 through 4 says, You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Now he's talking about, oh, you know, you have whatever you ask me in my name, I'll give you, right? That's what Jesus says. Um, basically, that's what people say he says. In verse 3 here, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. And then he goes to verse 4. Okay, Remember how Jesus says, you ask according to my name? Well, let's see if these people are in accordance with the name of the Lord. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enmity of God. So I'm like, well, you know, can you be an adulterer or an adulteress and ask something in the name of Jesus? Right? That means the nature, character, and authority. Of course you can sit there and just put that tagline on the end of of your prayer. That, when you say in the name of Jesus, it's not a cute tagline. Right? It means the nature, character, and authority. So the last scripture before I end this podcast here. In 1 John 5, 14, 15, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, what? According to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, I'm going to go full circle around to this, that around to the beginning I said, These are not formulas. These are not incantations. This is not voodoo. This is not some way of tricking God. You know how how children will say to their parents, well, you said, you said this, and they'll throw their word back up in their their face. And and the parent knows, you know, this, (laughs) you took that wrong. You took it out of context and so forth. It's the relationship that the parent has with the son. When they don't off when they don't answer the petition of the child, it's for their their best interest. You know, the kid wants to say, Well, I want to be able to pray in the front yard yard that doesn't have a fence. Well, the father of that child knows that this is what they really want. Their selfish, lustful desire wants that, but they may get hit by a car. You know, they're not mature enough. They're not walking in a mature enough level 
to be trusted in that area of even having that prayer answered. Are you with me? So we need to ask in accordance to our maturity with our relationship with Christ and according to his will. And that's the interesting thing. When you ask, now, there are prayers that I have had answered in my life that seem somewhat selfish. Like I prayed for um, a Dodge Durango. This is what I wanted. I found a word of the Lord that, you know, he will cause me to ride upon the high places. I was planting that. I was sowing that as, as seed. I prayed for a specific mileage. I prayed for a specific uh, price that I could have faith for. You know, it wasn't free, but I'm like, you know, I'll know that it's God if it's at this particular price. So, and one of the things I was talking about is is at that time, my car was kind of going downhill. I had a real small car, and I was, um, I would go camping a lot. And I, I would camp, but I would seek the Lord. When I camped, it wasn't just to have fun. I would go by myself, and I would pray. And I kind of like said, you know, it'd be really nice if I had a, a more roomier vehicle so I could take more stuff. And and uh, it would be neat if I could take my music equipment in a in a bigger vehicle. And it's like the Lord planted the desire in my heart for this Dodge Durango. This is the Cats 22. I'm like going, you know, was this really my selfish prayer? Or did the Lord plant this desire like he did Hannah? And I'm like going, Hmm. So I'm praying this thing through, and then one time the Lord says, "Well, give your car to this to a person," and I said, "Lord, I'm not doing that because you haven't given me my Durango yet." And uh, the interesting thing is, right after he said that, he said, "I have answered your prayer. You haven't gotten it." I'm like, going, "Oh my gosh, this is a whole new facet of prayer that I didn't know. God had answered the prayer." In the heavenly realm. You know, he will open the windows of heaven so that you cannot contain it. We hear that verse in Malachi chapter 3. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm learning something new about answered prayer. So I had to go and get it. Ask, seek, and knock. Yeah, I had to do my asking, my seeking, and then knocking. So I did all three of those. And it turns out that sure enough, there was my Dodge Durango. And and the story goes kind of like this. Um, I found it not too far from where I was living at the time. And I went to the lot, and I saw it from afar. I'm like, there it is. Oh, the angels are singing, you know, that type of thing. And and I kept watching it from afar, and people would go up to it. And I noticed this immediately. They would go up to it and get within three or four feet and then just turn around. I mean, it was a supernatural thing. So I watched it about 10, maybe 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, there's something there's something about this and uh so i went up to the shop the guy that was running the uh the car lot and i said why are people walking away he goes i don't know dude but this we've had this car for six months and people kept doing this they kept just turning walking up to it and turning away and uh the owner kept lowering the price because he couldn't sell it and it turns out that it was the exact mileage the exact color the exact year everything that i had been praying for and it had just fallen within my price range So there you go. There's some cool stuff about asking, seeking, and knocking. Today we were talking about praying selflessly. We need to not think of ourselves, but think of you know think of it as a family problem. We need to pray for each other that we may be healed, and we also need to pray within the will and parameters of God. So we're going to continue. We're going to be talking about prayer more over the next few podcasts. God bless you. Um, If this has touched your life, please consider sharing this on your favorite social media. Email it around. And also, there's a support page. You can support at conradrocks.net. Check out the support page at conradrocks.net. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at conradrocks.net.